How's it going everybody? So in this video, we are going to be going over a, about eight different um, flawed assumptions that are commonly viewed as facts in human science and, and in human science textbooks, okay? So a lot of these are assumptions that don't actually have any real uh, uh, causal evidence behind them, doesn't have any real tangible uh, human trials show, demonstrating that these things actually occur and or some of them actually have counter evidence against them. Okay, even the ones that do have some evidence that kind of suggests it's the case, uh, there may be counter evidence that suggests there might be more to the story, if anything. Okay, so uh, I encourage you because your quack alarms, your quack alarms are going to go off when you watch this and I encourage you to ask me questions about why I feel the way I do or if you have if you disagree with any of these points post it in the comments and let's have a conversation I have no appreciation or respect for people that just leave derogatory comments or you know confirmation bias reinforcing comments like oh you are full of crap period you know stuff like that in my comments I, I want to see value I want to see you make comp, um, comprehensible, wait, yeah, points that we can comprehend and discuss and extract value from, if anything, okay? So let's begin. Uh, the first one, and I'm reading off of a post I made on Instagram, basically, as an as a outline. The first one is protein and amino acids supposedly can be stored as fat tissue at least to a noticeable or significant effect, uh, degree. All right, so first of all, there are actually no human studies that I'm aware of actually showing where amino acids eventually end up if eaten in excess, okay? So I've talked about many times about the studies that we have. So when in studies where they overfeed protein, okay, uh, there are studies that, that show uh, taking a sedentary individual who is already eating around um, 80 grams of protein at baseline, about half their body weight in grams, and they're sedentary, they're not doing any exercise or anything. When they are put on a intervention in a study where they double their protein intake, they go from 80 grams a day to around 160 grams, uh, almost their body weight in grams of protein they actually uh, gain a significant amount of muscle mass with no resistance training or exercise routine even added. They actually see a significant increase in muscle mass just by doubling their protein intake and eating about the gra a gram of protein per pound of body weight. Okay, This has been shown, and I think it was a, it was a two-week trial, two-week study or something like that, so that's a or, or is a six week trial. So there, there there's a couple of these. So uh, that's the first thing, okay. And uh, I'll, I'll find it and try to link it down below in, in the description. But should be in my uh, my bookmarks on Google Chrome. So there's that one. Uh, so we know just by eating the optimal standard dose of protein that that most experts recommend, uh, we you know double the, the RDI of protein, we see a noticeable increase in lean mass in a short amount of time with no resistance training added. The second thing is uh, when you take trained athletes, okay, and you, and you, you put them on a, a routine where they overfeed protein and they compare them to a control group that continue to eat the same amount of protein, uh, but adds more uh, excess calories, okay? So both groups are eating excess calories. The, the high protein group is overfeeding those calories from protein. Uh, and we're talking going from one gram per pound of, of, of body weight of protein up to around uh, 1.6 grams of protein per pound of body weight. Um, and they compare that to a group that's still eating the one gram per pound of, of, of body weight of protein, but they're getting, they're making up the extra calories from carbs and fats. What you actually see is both groups 
increase lean mass, or sorry, sorry, both groups increase body weight to a significant degree uh, over a period of 12 weeks. But the group that's overeating protein, okay, they're eating uh, 0.6 grams of protein per pound of body weight more than the control group that's just getting the extra ca the excess calories with the same protein uh, the same but one gram per pound of body weight. What you see is the overfeeding protein group. They experience the same increase in body weight, but almost all of that extra body weight is from lean mass. Okay. And it's something like three kilos of, of extra body weight or something like that, which is a pretty substantial amount, mostly coming from lean mass. And they don't see very much noticeable fat gain in that group. So then you also, we also have studies that overfeed up to three grams per pound of lean mass per day. Um, and there is no significant increase in body fat from that level of, of protein overfeeding. And in fact, we see again a significant increase in lean mass. Uh, and I will say anecdotally myself, um, when, anytime I increase my protein light years beyond the recommended intake um, or even the optimal intake, uh, you know, there's a point where I literally went from eating 3,000 calories a day on average um, uh, with mostly my, most of my calories coming from carbs actually, around 400 grams of carbs a day. And uh, I was eating maybe 120 grams of protein a day, which is really low. And then I tripled my protein intake almost. I started eating about 300 grams a day and I went on the, the freaking keto carnivore experiment uh, where I was eating like four to 5,000 calories from butter and coconut oil, and I was tracking in chronometer. Uh, I dropped 15 pounds in a matter of uh, six weeks, and all of my strength on all of my, my strength on all my lifts started going up, which was really weird. So I'm just throwing that out there, and there's other people out there. Uh, you've got a lot of these like, you know, bro, bro science bodybuilder cultures that recommend these crazy protein intakes and um, there's dog crap training, which, which is, a uh, Dante Trudell or whatever, who I believe recommends insane amounts of protein combined with insane, like failure training at a lower frequency. And they believes that it increases lean mass when you eat way more protein, I believe. So I'm just saying there is, uh, so, so there's evidence that overfeeding protein doesn't seem to lead to significant body fat and seems to increase mostly lean mass, if anything. That's the first thing. The second thing is we don't really have human trials showing, you know, trying to overfeed protein to humans and seeing it end up as body fat. The third thing is we know just looking at the physiological pathways, these amino acids, okay, so, you know, you eat protein, breaks down a large peptide, small, then smaller peptides, then uh, amino acids, individual amino acids, once protein breaks down into amino acids, you know, and it's absorbed in the bloodstream, these amino acids all work like completely different substances. I mean, not quite, but to a certain degree, they have completely different um, places that they end up later down the line in metabolism. It's not like when you eat different carb sources, the majority of them, you know, you have uh, galactose, lactose, gla uh, glucose, fructose, and a lot of these uh, metabolize differently, but in general, the end result is to produce more glucose, and they all kind of serve similar functions, like energy production. But if you take, you know, there's two amino acids that are potentially uh, gluconeogenic. You have alanine, and then there's one more, and I forget which one it is. Um, but they can be converted to glucose, and that's only under very specific and extreme conditions. Uh, but we have, for example, phenylalanine, which eventually gets converted into tyrosine and thyroid hormone, you know, thyroxine. It can contribute to adrenaline being produced, dopamine, um, you know, melanin. Like there's a wide variety of pathways that that phenylalanine amino acid from protein from that meat that you ate eventually ends up 
And none of these really suggest that that amino acid turns to fat somehow, although it might exist. There's, you know, what's another one? Um, you know, glutamic acid maybe, right? It can eventually turn into glu uh, glutamine. It can turn into, uh, it can, has roles in things like glycine, glutathione production. Um, there's a lot of, you know, it can turn into a neurotransmitter. It can be incorporated into the gut lining. Like there's a lot of area, there's a lot of things that, that happen with amino acids that don't have any kind of relevance to fat gain. Uh, enzyme production, amino, um, neurotransmitter, all, all the neurotransmitters in your, in your, in your body. Uh, also being fermented and metabolized by gut bacteria, supposedly, right? Like the deal with carnosine and carnitine, supposedly. Um, and obviously your amino, uh, your, uh, immune system, glutathione, superoxide dismutase. Uh, there's a lot of air eventual areas that it can, you know, uh, response to viruses, lysine and, and, uh, lysine and, and uh, yeah. So I believe alanine as well. So yeah, I'm just saying like, we know for a variety of like mechanism, uh, a variety of pathways that amino acids can travel down, but a lot of them are very like, they don't really, they're even the physiological mechanisms are not in alignment with fat gain. Okay. So we don't have human trials to back it up. We don't have, I mean, the physiological pathway exists, but it doesn't, the pathways don't even suggest, like it, it would go through a lot of effort to eventually create f fat from amino acids. Um, and don't even get me started about this idea that, you know, your body can rely on protein for energy. Like that requires a very specific starvation, extreme type of like situation for that to ever happen, for gluconeogenesis to happen, even in a ketogenic, low carb type state. So let's see. Uh, so the next thing, so let's move on. The next thing is this idea that uh, that you need carbs in your diet to refill glycogen. Okay. This is controversial, but I encourage you to ask me questions about this and remain open-minded. Okay. So first of all, most, uh, exercise science researchers now know, like even ones that are not into like keto land and stuff, they know even in carb adapted athletes, after about 24 hours, your body refills glycogen regardless of what you eat, okay? Um, there's no arbitrary amount of hours after your workout that you need to eat carbs in order for glycogen to be refilled. As a matter of fact, your body even digesting, absorbing, and metabolizing dietary carbohydrates it can take a wide variety, a wide range of hours in different time levels before it even produces glycogen, glucose, or what have you. The more complex the carbohydrate, the more complex the process is to break it down and eventually turn into glucose and glycogen anyway. So like a lot of people wrongfully assume if they eat like oatmeal in the morning, that's going to turn into energy for their workout an hour or two later. When in reality, they're, you know, to break down a lot of those uh, complex fibrous carbohydrates like that found in oats, it has to be, you know, a lot of them are fermented by gut bacteria, for example. Some of them are immediate, you know, they're metabolized and turn into glucose within a matter of three hours, two to three hours. Um, and just because your blood sugar rises in response to eating a carbohydrate, a lot of times doesn't even mean it's... The, the glucose spike comes from the digestion and absorption of the carbohydrate. It's a very like intricate process, but you know, nonetheless, I'm just saying like, you know, there's a lot of really weird misconceptions. Like you have to eat carbs in your breakfast to give you energy for your workout at lunchtime. Like, that's not necessarily true. Uh, the ideal time to eat carbs is more so like, eight to 12 hours or more before training. Cause that gives you time to actually convert those carbs, like carb loading the night before. 
But even then, most experts agree it takes a number of days for these dietary carbs to, you know, metabolize and restore glycogen. But after 24 hours, glycogen or contribute to glycogen, I should say. Glycogen is adequately refilled after about 24 hours regardless. So we have evidence in carb adapted athletes that glycogen is refilled through other means mostly endogenous processes after 24 hours. And we actually have uh, intervention trials that compares uh, elite level trained endurance runners or endurance athletes who are actually adapted to a fat-based diet and compares elite level uh, trained endurance athletes who are adapted to a, a carb-based diet, and then they put them head-to-head -head on actual exercise equipment, and they actually measure using um, muscle biopsies. Uh, they measure glycogen at rest. They measure glycogen immediately following the exercise protocol, which is one hour at maximum intensity. And then they, they measure their glycogen levels about four hours after giving them each a recovery shake. And they gave the fat adapted athletes a fat based uh, recovery drink, and the carb adapted athletes a carb based recovery drink. And what they found is both athletes had about the same level of glycogen at baseline, and then they both lost significant some amounts of glycogen immediately following the exercise intervention. And then four hours later, both athletes even though the fat adapted athletes were given like a no a low carb you know high fat recovery shake both athletes after 4 hours recovered glycogen to the same degree and i believe some inter in inter individual variants existed where some of the fat adapted athletes actually recovered faster their glycogen faster which is interesting so that's the first thing involved in that it's actually been studied the problem is, though, this study, the fat-adapted athletes have been adapted to a mostly ketogenic diet for longer than 18 weeks, some of them a number of years, okay? And this is, and, and this is where a lot of the evidence suggesting that you need carbs for performance messes up, is most of them, they're taking the 99% of the population that have been eating carbs their entire life. Okay, and they're trained athletes or untrained or whatever, and then they put them in an intervention for two, two to four weeks where they suddenly change their diet that they've been eating their entire life and remove these carbs that their body's relying on for energy their entire life. And in this short period of time, two to four weeks, they remove the carbs, now they're eating keto, and then they put them on an exercise program and measure their performance. And it's like, bro, for, you take someone who's been eating carbs their whole life, and then you completely change their, their body's energy, you know, main energy reliance substrate. And you expect them to not have substantial decrements in four weeks. That's like taking an untrained individual who's never done a strength training program, and then you put them on like a, a five by five squat, bench, and deadlift strength training program, and you measure the amount of soreness and fatigue and their ability to walk up the stairs for two to four weeks after starting. It literally follows the same pattern when you actually look at long-term studies, where the longer that you expose your body to this new kind of physiological stimulus, because this is a huge one, whether it is adding a vigorous strength training routine or literally changing where your body gets its energy from that you've been on your whole life, uh, the first two weeks are really rough. People feel like they got hit by a fucking truck. On both of these interventions, whether it's strength training from a sedentary individual or a ketogenic low-carb diet from someone who's been eating carbs their whole life, it takes weeks for their body to start to acclimate and adapt. It really does. But then you look at this trial that I'm talking about conducted by Stefan Fenny and Jeff Volok. At trained athletes that have been on this protocol for for years that are now acclimated and adapted, 
they refill glycogen faster, and they use glycogen too. Like some people, they were they have a, a rebuttal to it. They're like, well, they're that's because they don't eat glycogen, so their body's preserving glycogen now, you know. And they're performing at the same pace. They're both and competing at the highest level. It's not like they have any decrement. And then, and then they're like, well, that's endurance performance. It's mostly reliant on fat. So that's actually where the next point that we have. This is point number three. So in the same study that I'm talking about, and this has been verified from multiple studies now, pass a certain VO2 max threshold. This is the third assumption that's wrong. Pass a certain VO2 max threshold. Supposedly, all athletes switch over to predominantly burn carbs and glucose in order to sustain their ATP production. And, and supposedly fat oxidation becomes signific significantly less of a contributor, okay? So supposedly there's like this uh, arbitrary percentage of VO2 max where athletes hit what they call the anaerobic threshold where you're training so hard that in order for your body to keep up with producing ATP, it can no longer get that ATP from oxidizing your body fat. And now it needs to produce energy from a quicker burning fuel source to sustain the ATP production. So from breaking down glycogen in the liver and the muscle tissue. The problem with that is it's been studied. Jeff Olock, Seth and Finney, they've actually, cause they, they've actually studied in elite level athletes. Uh, and in this particular study with the glycogen refilling that I mentioned, the, they measured the beta oxidation in both ath in both groups of athletes. And what they found is the carb-based athletes were burning no more than around one gram of, of fat per minute, okay, something like that. But then the fat-based group, the keto-based group, the low-carb group, they were burning up to two grams of fat Beta, you know, oxidizing two grams of fat per minute. So they were using more fat for energy. However, even more crazy is uh, past seven. Uh, so the, 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 the fat adapted athletes were able to oxidize fat for energy. They're able to produce ATP from fat, literally beta, oxidi beta oxidizing um the majority of their of their energy at levels past 90% of their VO2 max. It was something around 94% was like the, the highest uh, measured, something to that extent. So the what I see with a lot of this is it's not always that these textbooks are wrong, but it's that they're making assumptions based on the evidence we have and the evidence that we have is mostly done on the context in which the, 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 the test subjects are living under. And the problem is in regards to things like keto adaptation, how much fat you burn at various levels of exercise, there are so many fact confounding variables. First of all, even if you're all eating carbs, how trained you are can actually change the amount of fat you burn per minute and how intensely of exercise you can burn fat up to. The second thing is um, the pattern of diet and where what you normally eat. Like it's common actually for a lot of endurance trainers, not all but a lot, to train a certain way and paradise their nutrition in a certain way to where they get a system where they actually do periods of um, like low carb, high fat dieting because they actually notice they get better performance and in longer into the race with less gel packs needing to be used where they hit the wall at low, you know, um, less. And, and so they've done periodic, uh, low carb diets cause they've seen that in the field. And how do you think that would translate in regards to this VO2 max equation and how much fat you can burn quickly? It would look just like what I just mentioned. And so this arbitrary number that you see in the, you know, strength and conditioning essentials textbooks and, and, and the sports physiology textbooks, 
it's a very specific context in which these study conditions are under, and it does not translate into real-world outcomes. And this is something that I learned the hard way back when I was eating a diet that was supposedly based on the best science and all this other stuff and was not translating into me having better health. And you see a lot of people suffering from a lot of disease states and other things that are, um, can, 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 you know, very, yeah, so very conducive to that. So, um, so let's see. So that was the third one. The fourth one, okay, and by the way, I follow a mostly meat diet and I only, I consume honey around my hardest training sessions and that's it. And I mostly fasted most of the day. I don't see any, I, I see actually carbs for some reason, the more carbs I eat, the more lethargic I feel and the worse my exercise performance is. I don't know why, that's just something that happens. So let's see. The fourth assumption that's flawed. Depression seems to be caused by a neurochemical imbalance in the brain, mostly serotonin. So I just saw an article that actually, surprisingly, Brandon Gilbert from My Parent Herbs had shared on his Instagram. And I thought was, you know, very profound because um, I know he doesn't really, from my, from my gather, you know, look into that stuff as much anymore. But whatever. Read through that and it's interesting. So look, a lot of these drugs that they prescribe for things like depression and, psych, you know, uh, psychiatric illnesses and things, um, we don't actually even know the mechanism of effect, the, the mechanism of action. Of things like Seroquel, for example, which I was on like 2,400 milligrams since I was like nine years old up until past the age of 21 or, you know, up until I was 21 before I got myself off of it and experienced the worst, the worst withdrawal symptoms for two years where I felt like I was literally going crazy. And uh, it's like the withdrawal symptoms of a lot of these drugs a lot of times actually cause significantly worse problems and oftentimes the very exact problems that you were seeking to treat in the first place with the drugs. I actually felt more um, mentally unstable on those drugs than I ever did off of them. Uh, except for with the withdrawal period made me feel like I was losing my absolute mind. Literally for two, almost three years. Uh, the withdrawal symptoms were that bad, but of course I'm lucky to even have survived that high dose of such a powerful drug like Seroquel. Those who actually know about Seroquel would probably agree with me. <laughs> They're like, damn, how did anyone ever get away with prescribing? <laughs> That's crazy. So anyway, holy crap. Um, we don't even know what Seroquel actually does. Most people, like patients who take these drugs, they're convinced, like they're confident because they've been told they're like, oh no, we know very well what these drugs do, and we know what it, you know, what 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 the mech it, it's a serotonin reuptake inhibitor and blah blah blah. No, we actually don't. We don't have any real causal evidence that that's the case. Most doctors admit that that's the, that we don't actually know what the what the, what it is. Most doctors they just see, okay, what symptoms are you coming to me with? What class of drugs are indicated for these symptoms? And the thing is you diagnose the symptoms that you're experiencing and you label it as like depression or type 1 bipolar, type 1, 2, or type 2 bipolar, you know, manic depression, schizophrenia, psychoactive schizophrenia, ADHD. And then the worst thing about all that is like there are so many – like you meet so many different people that all have the same diagnosis. And this could be anything. This could be heart disease, for example, but, and they all live very different lifestyles, have very different diets, have different upbringings, different exercise tendencies, whether they're smoking, drinking, alcohol, whatever, different psychology, but they're all diagnosed with the same exact illness, supposedly, and that creates an illusion where they all think that the cause is the same thing. The reality is, you can meet 12 different people with, that are diagnosed with bipolar disorder, for example. And all 12 of those different people could literally completely resolve their issue through completely different treatments. Some of them might completely be resolved with a medication like Seroquel. Some of them completely resolve 
their problem with cognitive behavioral therapy. One of them might literally do a keto diet like I did and completely resolve all their issues and be a completely different person. Another one might have just had trauma in childhood, and that is a very common thing that contributes. And uh, either using therapy or maybe just developing a better relationship with their parents and get seeking some kind of forgiveness or something could literally heal all of that. And you hear all the time people that had something like this, an issue like that, like bipolar or even schizophrenia, who supposedly find God. Like this sound, this might make pe- some people laugh. But they, but the people with depression, with with whatever, schizophrenia, bipolar, you hear a lot of things like that, where they they go to church and pray. And I, by no means, am not a Christian whatsoever, or would consider myself religious at all. And they resolve it by praying. And I don't believe that it was the bearded man in the sky that literally said, "Okay, my son, you have been cured," and zaps you or something. But the, I'm just saying, if if depression was is heavily influenced by a chemical imbalance, as people say, then we wouldn't see all these people experiencing what we know it what we know as spontaneous remission. Which there's actually books that have been written by high profile doctors that are called uh, spontaneous remission or something like that. Uh, look up Dr. Andrew Weil. I think it's spontaneous healing or spontaneous remission or something like that. And there's another doctor that I bought the book that made on that too. And you see this in, with cancer and all sorts of different diseases that doctors tell you are genetic. You're doomed for life. Your only option is pharmaceutical intervention. And myself included, pharmaceutical inter- intervention for what doctors told me I'd be in mental hospitals for the rest of my life for. They told me I'd never have a real life. No one would know that I ever suffered from supposed mental illness and was hospitalized when I was a child. No one would know that if they talked to me now. In fact, talking to a psychologist at when I, after I was 21, he told me he thinks I was wrongfully diagnosed. Even though he acknowledged when I, when I told him who my doctor was, he was like, whoa, that's, you know, that psychiatrist, he, he's got all these accolades. He's considered the best in the United States and all this stuff. And I was, I was included in one of his books, surprisingly. Somehow told, said that I was never going to live a normal life. Told my mom that. Because my, my supposed mental illness was so bad. And I actually d- discovered later on, well, my nutrition was definitely, it was a typical. You see people all the time. Uh, I, I've, I've seen it time and time again. You, you see what children are eating for breakfast. Uh, you know, f- freaking cocoa puffs and cereal and milk, and then chicken nuggets for lunch or whatever, and they don't even eat dinner sometimes. And then you expect them to do good in school and 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 not have mental illness. They're not even giving their brain the f- the the amino acids and the building blocks it needs for for health, and they're eating mostly sugar. You know, what do you expect? When when I started eating a proper diet, and then of course I started to reflect on potential childhood trauma and stuff like that. Uh, look at me now. Well, you know, and I would say I'm not. <laughs> I think everyone has you know some mental illness. I'm prone to overwhelming anxiety, but anyway, that's just the main overarching thing. There's no actual evidence that serotonin is the cause of of depression. And the big thing is a lot of these pharmaceutical drugs, they're still like a f- not even a 40% success rate. Uh, a lot of those clinical trials, I don't want to go too ham, too in-depth on the clinical trials. But let's just say the magnitude of effect of a lot of these clinical trials are hardly impressive whatsoever or show a high magnitude of effect for a lot of these drugs. A lot of them are kind of influenced by corporate funding and and industry, and some of the results may be tweaked somehow. And furthermore, um, I find it crazy how so many uh, experts, psychiatrists, doctors, whatever, or influencers in the field – when you when someone someone like me comes on and I'm like, yeah, man, I take like rhodiola and this and that, and I, I I experience a significant antidepressant effect, blah blah blah. People are like, no, there's no evidence, 
you know, the trials on it aren't print impressive. It's a placebo. I'm like, have you seen the freaking p- control trials and intervention trials that are on the drugs that you think are are like, oh, it's a golden standard, you know, no supplements come close to pharmaceuticals. Like, really? A lot of these things like ashwagandha, rhodiola, um, L-tyrosine even, right? The clinical evidence on that a lot of times way outclass what you see in pharmaceuticals and – you have some that go directly head to head, like St. John's wort, and you see. Uh, I think. I think. Don't quote me on this. There was a trial that compared St. John's wort to Paxil, and you find St. John's wort seems to be in some cases even more effective, potentially. So, anyway, there's no evidence that depression is even one thing. There's some evidence that suggests it's neuroinflammation, uh, and also we know. Just by experiencing different mood states, our neurochemical uh, 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 balance changes. Right now, I'm clerically really worked up. Um, You know, uh, the food that I eat, like I had some coffee, that increases adrenaline. Um, I'm talking. This is lighting up all these different parts of my brain on a on a brain scan. You would see all this activity going on. Uh, You know, I'm hyped up. You know. Different mood states will look differently on brain scans. I've seen people post these memes. I'm sure you all have too where they're like, look, somebody with depression is physically different. Their brain is structured different than somebody who's normal. Look at this scan. There's a scan of an alcoholic and there's a scan of a person with ADHD and there's a scan of a normal person and a scan of a schizophrenic. All these brain scans look different. Therefore, it's genetics. You need to treat me differently. I'm a special snowflake. And I think, yeah, we need to have empathy for other people and stuff. But the problem is that's flawed thinking. Any different mood state, if you're low on sleep, uh, different types of foods, if you're fasted versus not fasted, if you're on a ketogenic diet versus not, uh, how much sleep you had, uh, how much adrenaline you have, if you're angry right now, they're going to look different on a brain scan and you'll have a different expression of neurochemical balance. It changes how your the your uh, dopamine is converted into adrenaline and other things, and how it's using different nutrients to convert amino acids and things. So, so yeah, um, that is all sorts of fucked up. These assumptions, and I have so much more to talk about, but such little time. So we're gonna move on. Um, if you want to hear more about that post example, I have so much to say about that. Uh, number five, fiber plays a major role in regulating bowel function. They say probably you'll probably develop scurvy eventually. Oh, wait, no, that's the the sixth one. (laughs) The fiber plays, uh, if you don't eat fiber, you'll probably suffer from constipation and et cetera. Okay. So first of all, on an anecdotal level, so I did Mediterranean plant-based diet Literally, I went from eating refined foods mostly to all of a sudden think, uh, taking my nutrition seriously in 2012, eating all this fiber and plants and whole grains. I had the worst constipation. I developed IBS, and I felt horrible. And I was told, well, your gut microbiome takes some time to adapt. A year later, my gut microbiome did not adapt. All through 2000, the later half of 2012, And then 2013, I just went ham with fiber intake and stuff. I have videos, vlogs from that time where I show making these crazy like vegetable smoothies and stuff. I always felt horrible, couldn't sleep, couldn't breathe. I felt like I had an unbelievable amount of undigested food in my my stomach, and I did. Um, 2014... You know, I I was really just going ham on the organic, uh, plant-based Mediterranean diet, mostly unsaturated fats, fish and white meat. I felt horrible, horrible, horrible. Then I went completely like vegan for a year. And it's like the more fiber and plants I ate, the worse my digestion got. If I wasn't constipated, I was shitting out undigested plants. Tried all sorts of things, enzyme supplements, probiotic supplements, but there's, there's no evidence that those things even do anything either. Anyone who says gut microbiome, healthy gut, 
there's no no real definition for that. They're they're charlatans usually. They're not evidence based practitioners, but. Fiber has only been shown to be associated with certain benefits in observational trials. The reason why is because the more fiber people eat in observational trials, usually the more whole foods they're eating and the less refined foods, and thus you'll see a tiny statistical difference. You'll see people maybe having less cancer risk and heart disease, but when you actually look at absolute risk, you don't see much of a difference anyway. There's actually quite a few intervention trials that that show Crohn's disease gets worse with more fiber. Uh, diverticulitis might actually be highly sensitive to fiber, where the more uh, the more fiber people eat, the more symptoms they have. There's actually uh, studies that show a complete removal of all fiber seems to increase bowel frequency, uh, bowel regularity and frequency, and there's like especially a cutoff point where the more fiber someone eats, they actually develop even worse bowel frequency. And on an individual basis, you will actually constantly see N equals one, lots of anecdotes of people who reversed a large amount of intestinal disorders, including myself, the less fiber they eat, where they actually experience, like myself, amazing bowel function, the best ever in my entire life, eating mostly just meat and no freaking fiber. By the way, I'm not a carnivore zealot, but I'm just throwing that out there. So I'm just saying, the and what we know is fiber, the definition of fiber is indigestible plant matter. The more fiber you eat, the more indigestible matter is gonna be moving through your intestine, the wider that intestine's gonna be, okay? And the bigger your poop. But just because fiber bulks up your fucking poop doesn't mean that – doesn't actually mean that it makes poop easier to pass. To me, I think it's more so clogging up the pipes. That's been my experience. So I've never had easier to pass stool since I raised my salt intake, raised my fat intake, and lowered my fiber intake. That's what I've experienced. It's more so hydration and lubrication, I think, that matters. And then removing things that, like, clog the pipes. Next thing, there's this assumption. Uh, if you don't eat enough fruits and vegetables, you're going to develop scurvy eventually. And it's usually not this specific in, in health science textbooks. It's usually inferred, okay? But experts always tell you carnivore diet is going to kill you. You got to make sure you eat fruits and vegetables or you're going to get scurvy. Okay, look, again, I don't care. I don't think that plants are deadly or poisonous. I am not a carnivore zealot. I don't advocate or recommend everyone eat carnivore. I don't think that the healthiest diet exists. What I'm about is scientific accuracy, and what I'm about is preventing people from forcing themselves to eat foods like whole grains like I did for so long that are directly contributing to their autoimmune disorder and in some cases intestinal disorders where doctors are telling you diet doesn't help and the only option is getting your intestine removed. To me, that's messed up and that's malpractice when you're, ba you're like, oh yeah, you've got to eat whole grains, bro, or else you're going to develop nutritional deficiencies. Where's your freaking causal evidence? Oh no, these carnivore people. There's no evidence that the carnivore diet is safe. Where's your fucking long-term intervention trial showing your vegetarian, your vegan diet safe? We have some evidence, but it's not, a, it's not what we're really asking for. We do have some evidence suggesting the so-called keto or carnivore or animal-based diet. We have some. We have evidence that Atkins diet is safe in all regards, reverses all sorts of diseases to a better degree than plant-based diets except for LDL. So anyway, we have an intervention trial. It's a 12-month intervention. But anyway, there's no evidence that, you know, you're going to like – there's no like causal link between – like uh, that, you know, whatever. There's only the stories about the sailors and pirates that have developed scurvy uh, when they're eating almost exclusively processed foods. Um, I forgot what the diet was that caused scurvy. It was like spoiled salted pork. It, oh, it was saltine crackers. 
You're eating refined, salted, you know, flour, crackers, and uh, supposedly like salted pork, right? And you're out there at sea with no fresh water and all this other stuff. No fresh food, relying on a really poor refined food diet, and then you exp you 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 are surprised when you develop a nutritional deficiency. Then there's things like berry berry vitamin uh, vitamin B one deficiency. Literally, we never experience vitamin B one deficiency until um, until like uh, certain populations start to refine rice. They went from brown rice to white rice. It wasn't until the refined foods came in the food supply that we saw identifiable, like identifiable isolated nutrient deficiencies where we can give you the nutrient in a lab that's isolated like a B1 supplement and then you resolve the, the, the issue. If you have scurvy, you take vitamin C supplement and it will resolve. If you have vitamin B1 deficiency, beriberi, um, and you – consume a vitamin B1 supplement, it'll resolve, okay? But the problem is we don't ever see those, those deficiency syndromes unless you're eating a refined food diet. The thing is, it never existed until then. There was uh, symptoms of malnourishment from just like a lack of food intake in general, but even in populations who ate mostly whole grains with a little bit of meat, like the ancient Egyptians were fat, sick, overweight, uh, and seemed to suffer from diabetes and arteriosclerosis. They were eating mostly freaking whole wheat bread. Okay? Um, you only see those deficiencies under extreme circumstances. But I'll tell you this. We have thousands of people now and now who are coming out with their testimonials and documented cases of, for one, reversing all other diseases, eating a meat-only diet. Again, I'm not telling you that that's a diet you got to follow. I'm not saying vegetables are poisonous. What I'm saying is what we know about uh, essential nutrition is wrong is what I'm trying to say. But people will wrongfully think, oh, he's a freaking carnivore zealot and he's thinking – you don't need to eat vegetable, or your you know vegetables are bad and meat is good. No, I'm just saying we have groups of people who eat nothing but meat. They did for years, for decades. Scurvy is a non-issue. Maybe there's like some very rare reports you don't hear much about. You don't see B1 deficiencies, even though most people are 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 not getting the adequate intake. We don't really see. All the so-called nutrient deficiency symptoms you would expect from people eating only muscle, red muscle meat. Even though we have minimum daily intakes of essential nutrition set out by government authorities and this thing where if you don't eat vegetables, you're going to die of constipation. You don't eat vegetables, you're going to die of vitamin C deficiency. Um, if you don't eat vegetables, you're going to die of a beta quarantine deficiency or a a B1 deficiency, a folate deficiency, you're not getting enough potassium, you're going to die, all these things. You don't see that. I didn't see that in practice. I have been going on almost three, yeah, almost four years now. It's going to be four years in 2023 where I have purposely sought out to eat as little of those foods as possible because they, they hurt me. They fucking hurt me. I feel like shit. When I base my diet on whole grains and on plant foods and all this stuff, purposely going out of my way to not eat fiber, to you know, and for the first two years it was mostly meat. I was not getting vitamin C, not getting a lot of B1 and folate, and feeling great usually most of the time. But now I'm getting vitamin C and fiber because I'm eating fruit again and and whatnot. So you know, but yeah, I'm just saying. There, and then we also have documented reports of, of sailors reversing scurvy with fresh reindeer meat. In, I think it's Scandinavia or something. So we just don't hear about that. The other thing is red meat does have vitamin C in it, and it seems to be just enough to stave off scurvy. Um, yeah. So we have evidence to the contrary. Lots of it. We don't have evidence that you necessarily need it. We have some evidence to suggest some of these things might be might not necessarily be beneficial, might be harmful. Um, 
There's a whole book written about recommended daily intakes of nutrients. It's called Vitamania by an author known as Catherine Price. And basically what I've gathered from that book is that vitamin deficiencies are a non-issue. The RDIs of nutrients is not based on any real solid evidence. And most evidence we have to, for like intakes of nutrients that would prevent deficiencies is based on what happens in uh, impoverished wor uh, third world countries and the symptoms they experience or weird experiments. Like for example, omega-3 deficiency, the time when we discovered that was in a hospital setting, there were patients that were uh, getting like an, um, their s parts of their digestive tract removed or something. And they had to be fed. They couldn't digest regular food, so they were being fed through a through a feeding tube, and they were given a solution of basically soylent green. It was like it was like whey protein, uh, uh, glucose powder, and then they were given a slew of vitamins and minerals that we know are essential to sustain life. And the and they were given soybean oil as their main fat source, and they eventually developed like a omega three deficiency. And they discovered when they changed the, the, the oil in their diet to something really weird, like to not to flaxseed oil, but to like grapeseed oil or something. They were given a, another, a different vegetable oil that just had a slightly higher concentration of omega-3. And now they're neuro all their like neuroinflammatory symptoms and the, the skin issues and things that they suffered as a result of supposed, you know, a fatty acid imbalance change and, and, and resolved. Well, now you have all these nutritionists telling you, get an omega-3 supplement. You need your essential omega-3s. And we have these uh, arbitrary levels of omega-3 that we, that we think we need. Literally, you know, they're like, if you, you know, if you have skin issues, if you have brain issues, you're probably not getting enough omega-3s. And it's like, bro, the only time that ever was actually clinically shown was in such an extreme circumstance that literally doesn't apply to you. They were being fed soybean oil as their main omega-3 source, and they were being fed through a, a freaking feeding tube fake foods. And most humans were eating plenty of vegetable oils, were eating, you know, a um, uh, little bit of meat here and there that supplies us way more omega-3s than those people are getting in those damn feeding tubes. There's a lot of really hardcore assumptions and extrapolations that are far, like taken so far out of context as the fact. And people are over here just like force themselves to get all this, the, these nutrients and things that they don't actually even need. And the main thing is that, number one, not only is there no real evidence that healthy individuals eating a balanced fucking diet need these things, um, you're not going to experience much difference if you're eating way under a lot of these RDI intakes, if you're just living in a first world country and eating a balanced diet. In a meat-only diet, people don't experience these things. Even there's people eating nothing but potatoes, and I don't recommend that. And it's like... They're surviving and not experiencing any of these negative symptoms. Not that I'd ever recommend that, and I guarantee you there's some things we could say about what they're probably experiencing. They may not realize their health negative effects of that, but still. Uh, so, yeah. Uh, I'll talk more about that some other time. Ask me questions about it in the comments, and I'll expand. So there's one more thing I want to mention in this video. Overtraining syndrome in athletes. Okay, I've talked about – I have a whole video on that. Go and watch that video, okay? Oh, and yeah, essential daily nutrition intakes and stuff, omega-3 deficiency, B defi vitamin deficiency. I think it mostly, if anything, it doesn't benefit the people. It's been shown to not benefit the people. We have uh, long-term trials that show vitamin and minerals, uh, vitamin supplementation, uh, if anything, increases your risk of can certain cancers and doesn't seem to provide a statistically significant benefit or clinically significant benefit. So we have evidence it doesn't even do anything when we when we take all the RDIs of vitamins from supplements. Um, and furthermore, it mostly just increases the profits of supplement companies. That's why for me, I eat meat, I eat fruit, okay? I might supplement a little bit of honey before my hardest training sessions. I take tonic herbs. I don't take any excess extra vitamins. 
I might take some magnesium, potassium, and salt sometimes for electrolytes. Um, and you probably don't need that either. But too many people, they, they take 30 different vitamins and mineral supplements because they're brainwashed. Don't even get me started on longevity research people who make these videos about MNM and all this shit, and they think they're on the cutting edge taking Reservatrol. Meanwhile, they're practicing caloric restriction, under-eating protein to limit mTOR and doing intermittent fasting, and they're not doing strength training. They look like string beans with low bone mineral density, and they're trying to tell you that if you take all their supplements and, and malnourish themselves too, you're also going to experience longevity. Meanwhile, their science is all bullshit, <laughs> so, and they don't look healthy at all. And they're young. They're not even going to reach 60 or 70 years old, and they're telling you how to reach a long, healthy age. So, uh, yeah, so overtraining doesn't exist. This video is about done with. I got to get out of here. Um, watch my video on overtraining that I did. Search it up. I, I have lots of videos on why that's absolute nonsense. There's actual intervention trials where they take test experiments and have them do hack squats to uh to like a 10 rep max several multiple sets of hack squats to failure every single day for a period of like i don't remember i think it was four to six weeks and they saw mostly improvements in strength the entire time their one rep max went up no regressions in strength and the only symptoms that they experienced were soreness and fatigue and after like the third week they didn't even experience significant soreness anymore there's a lot of experiments like that that don't show overtraining syndrome. And then you have me who freaking squats, benches, and deadlifts to a max every single day on top of jujitsu training. And I was doing both of that every single day when I had enough time to do so, sometimes multiple times a day. All I experienced is consistently increasing my strength levels on that. And I was able to do jujitsu. I felt warmed up and everything and primed. And everyone else was complaining. They're like, oh, I did legs today. That's why I suck. I'm like, bro, I've been maxing on, on deadlifts, squats, bench press every single day and doing jiu-jitsu and I'm fine. And I'm on a low-carb diet. Right by these textbooks, you got to follow that shit. That's the optimal way. I think the problem is people are following these arbitrary guidelines that, that actually set them up to fail. And I think if they did the experiments that I did and understand that actually you, we don't actually know what the fuck is going on. There's all sorts of shit that's wrong in these textbooks. You might actually be able to see – some crazy superhuman feats that I can see now, you know. And then I mentioned like, oh, this, the arbitrary sleep standards. I did a whole video with timestamps about why there's no evidence that we need more, you know, that we need a certain amount of sleep either. <laughs> All right. But no, no. Listen to the experts that profit, right? You need to do training programs by these experts. You can't just max every day. If you did a Bulgarian method, you know, you just get strength gains without even needing programming. No, you need these PhD exercise science researchers. You need, you need um, the 531 program. You need uh, Alexander Bromley and these people that say, oh, no, you're going to die if you do the Bulgarian method. Maxing out every day is a stupid thing. And they're trying to sell you these books and programs and coaching things, you know. And they don't want to believe you could just max out every day. You need, um, you need, you know, to suffer from these intestinal problems so that you can, you know, give the pharmaceutical interventions a try, right? Remove your colon. No, you need fruits and vegetables and whole grains. That's not causing your intestinal issue. The textbooks say fiber helps you. Textbooks say you need vitamin C. The textbooks say you're going to get fat and unhealthy and have col uh, uh, freaking develop diseases if you eat all this protein, right? So anyway, I, I'm sorry if I'm going off now, but I got to get out of here. Let me know in the comments if you have any questions. I'll talk to you all next time.